Okay, everyone. Today's Life Reimagined Pirkei Avot class is dedicated with pleasure in celebration of the engagement of Rabbi Shlomo and Khan Afarhi, his daughter Shoshana to Natano. <laughs> and also uh, is dedicated in loving memory of Elka Bat Frida Alea Shalom and Reuven Ben Mary Alea Shalom and Reuven Ben Mary Alea Shalom by Susan Hedaya Hazaku Baruch. Uh, we are up to chapter 5, Mishnah number 20. And this is a really famous Mishnah. And it really needs much more than one class, but um, we don't have much more than one class. So we'll just t- try and deal or give it a, uh, a, a treatment uh, today that is enough uh, with one class. Let's get ready to rumble. Yehuda ben Tema Omer, Yehuda the son of Tema used to say, Heve az kanamer, a person should be bold, az is an interesting word, we'll come back to it, kanamer like a leopard, vekal kanesher, and light like an eagle, ratz katsvi, the person should run like a deer, vegibor kari, and be as mighty as a lion, la asot ratzon avicha shebashamayim, in order to do the will of your father, who art in heaven. Who Haya Omer, he used to say, in other words, Yehuda ben Tema used to say, Az panim legehinam, uboshet panim leganeden. A person who has azut panim, they have chutzpah, they have a brazenness about them. That person is going, uh, unfortunately, down the uh, rocky road to, uh, to, to hell. Uboshet panim, and a person who has uh, a, an embarrassed face, a person who's bashful, who has the opposite of chutzpah, le Gan Eden. He has a portion in Gan Eden. Hashem Elokeinu May it be your will, Hashem, our God and the God of our fathers. She bane bet hamikdash merav yamenu that bet hamikdash should be built, rebuilt speedily in our days. Beten chelkenu b'toratecha and place our portion b'toratecha in your Torah. First of all, did Yehuda ben Tema just take a left turn and enter a synagogue? Why is he praying in the Mishnayot? Right? In the Mishnah, you teach us lessons. You don't give us prayers. Did Hillel ever say, uh, may it be Hashem, may it be your will, that uh, every Jew should find a shiduch and have healthy kids and make parnasah? Like, what, why is he praying in the Mishnah? Question number two. He starts off by telling you that you have to be as kanamer, bold like a leopard, and then he tells you one line later that if you have this trait of azut, of brazenness, of chutzpah, it takes you to, to hell. So you're supposed to have it or not supposed to have it. Third question. Why are you asking me to be like an animal? You want to tell me that I should have brazenness. Tell me, heve az. You want to tell me to be light like an eagle? Tell me, be kal, be light. You want to tell me to run? Tell me to run fast. What are they adding by bringing the example of an animal into it? What, what more are you saying here than just by saying, do this trait as opposed to run like a deer, or be strong like a lion. What, what are we supposed to learn from the examples? Is it just that this is an example of that to the max? Okay, so let's take apart this Mishnah together. And I want to start with a teaching that I remember from the Ben Ishchai. The Ben Ishchai answers the last question that we began, that we ended off with, and we'll begin with that answer with the answer to that first question. He says that the reason why the Mishnah tells us about these four traits in their animalistic form is because the courage of a lion is not something that is granted to you by the wicked witch of the West. The lightness of an eagle is not something that it goes to ye oldy preparatory school for eagles. Right? They didn't learn it in a school 
They didn't develop it at going to a Pirkei Avot class. These things are part and parcel of the nature of each one of these animals. Says the Ben Ishchai, the reason why the Mishnah gives it in its animal form is to tell you, we want you to onboard this Midah not as a learned character trait, but as a natural, elemental, essential part of your personality. I don't know if any of you had a chance to listen to this morning's class yet, but we talked about restoring in the month of Adar a natural sense of joy, as opposed to some sort of learned sense of joy. So let's try and distinguish between those two things. You know, you see a person who's walking down the street and they're happy, and you ask them why they're happy, and they tell you, I just got a promotion. They tell you, I just got this suit on sale in Bloomingdale's, it cost me $3, okay? I'm smiling because I can't believe I got such a good deal. Those things are literally external, extrinsic. They're not part of the human experience at its core. You might meet someone who's walking down the street and he's telling you I'm happy. Why? Because it feels good to be happy. That's internally motivated. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't need a reason. Is that clear? So says the Ben Ishchai, if I want you to have these four character traits, I don't want you to have them as something which is learned and which can be unlearned. I don't want them to be a secondary response. So as an example, a primary response of joy to something in life is different than a secondary response. So as an example, I get on a plane and I have, I'm upgraded to business class. But my friend is upgraded to first class. So my first reaction when our tickets come back, his stamped and mine stamped with the upgrade sticker, I look at his first class, I'm like, oh my gosh, amazing. I think I was also upgraded. I look at it, I see business class. So now I'm like, oh. Meanwhile, you shouldn't be, ah. Oh, you should be, yay. You had an economy class seat, and now you're sitting in a business class seat. It's still, maybe it doesn't lie flat, but it goes all the way back. You have a delicious meal, etc., etc. It's a good, good cause for celebration. So what happens? Primary response is, ah. Oh. Secondary response is, well, at least it's not. At least I got something, right? That's where your response to something is not natural, it's this logic that kicks in in the second place, not in the first place. Says the Ben Ishchai, what we're looking for here are these character traits onboarded in, your, in your, the core of your system. Um, raise your hand if you have an iPhone. Is there anyone here with an Android? Me and you. Android's a much better phone. Much better phone. But it's very convenient to have an iPhone. And everybody else has an iPhone. And if you're a techie, your Android is actually much more helpful than your iPhone is. And let me explain why. Androids, Samsung specifically, always comes out with advancements way before Apple. People don't realize this. Everyone thinks that the propaganda, they're like, oh, iPhone's the most advanced phone. iPhone is almost never the most advanced phone. Do you know why? Because iPhone will wait until that feature is stable in the phone, and then they'll adopt it. So some people are really happy for that. They're like, you know what? What, I need a, good, a new feature that's not going to work. But actually, the new feature might work perfectly, but you're just not going to have it for another year or two because Apple won't integrate it into their ecosystem, okay? That's number one. Apple is very cautious. Part of being cautious is that Apple does not allow access to third-party developers to their core software. So as an example, for years and years and years, I'm swiping. When I'm typing, I just swipe. I don't tap. You swipe. 
and it figures out what you swiped, okay? Ye for years and years and years and years, okay? In order to do that, you had to use a keyboard that was made by a third-party developer. So you have all these really creative people building apps, but iPhone will only let the app reach a certain level of their code. Beneath that level, they're not letting you interact with the core code of the phone. That they've kept locked and restricted even from the developers, okay? This Mishnah is telling you, we don't want this on a Apple level, we want this on an Android level. So if someone's gonna figure out a way to have a better keyboard, that keyboard's you're gonna be able to use it in, in the email application, in your text messaging. You'll be able to use it in every part of the phone. It's not just an app that sits outside of the system, it's an internal, hardwired part of the system. Now, the reason why I'm spending so much time explaining this is because I think so much of the process of changing Midot is really all about getting the difference between what the Ben Ishchai is expressing versus not realizing the difference between those two things. When you change, Rambam says, in order for your teshuvah to be real, there's a condition. How do we know that your teshuvah is real? Anyone remember? What does Rambam say? Sorry? No, that's the things you need. How do you know teshuvah is real in Rambam? If you're in exactly the same scenario, with exactly the same drive, with exactly the same motivation. So as an example, let's say a person uh, does a really daring you know, bank robbery in his 20s. And then when he's 95, he has another opportunity to try the same bank robbery, he doesn't do it. That doesn't prove he's done teshuvah. Maybe he just think he can, he doesn't think he can outrun the police anymore. Maybe he just thinks he can't jump the wall anymore. Maybe he just doesn't want to take any more risks because he's so old or he's not feeling well or whatever. So same person, everything the same. The only thing that's different about that time and this time is you. Real teshuvah is when the person hasn't changed a behavior, but they've changed an essence. And in truth, the real work of character development doesn't happen here. It happens deep in the, you know, in the boiler room of, your, of yourself. So ben, ben Te, Yehuda Ben Tema is here talking about creating lasting change. And a lot of times people ask, how do you create lasting change? It's so easy to change for a little bit. You know, it's so easy to get inspired. You know why? Because when you got inspired, you didn't actually change anything. You just changed your state of mind for a short amount of time. You just changed the way you feel about a certain thing for a certain amount of time. But the core desires, the core drive, the core negative character trait is exactly in the same position as it was in. So give it enough time and it will manifest itself yet again. So when you see people who, you know, you think, can a leopard change its spots and they don't change? You know, the person was lazy before and they're lazy now. The person was disrespectful before, they're disrespectful now. And you know what, you gave them an ultimatum. If you're gonna treat me that way, you're gonna be rude, I'm out. And they changed for a day or a week or a month or a year. The reason why is not because they changed and they changed back, right? The reason is because they did not change deep enough. Says Yehuda ben Tema, we want change of the change of nature to occur. So when the person is in that situation again, they're not fighting anymore. It is now their new nature to be bold, to be light, to be swift, or to be strong. Okay? So what we're talking about in the Mishnah now is something really pretty epic. Pretty what? Epic. Okay? So we're going to try and give it some time. I do need to leave on time today, so it's not, I don't have how exactly how much time we'll have to cover, but we'll do 
our very best. So let's take a look at the few, at the traits that are brought down in the Mishnah, and we'll try and deal with each one of those traits, okay? Heve az kanemer. You should be bold as a leopard. What is the boldness of a leopard? That's the lion. Not scared to do something. Sorry? Not scared to do something. Not scared to do something. Yes. There's a ferocity of that in the leopard, okay? It's not that it's as strong as the lion. It's not. But it does things that are larger than itself. There's a chutzpah to it. There's a rudeness almost to the a nerve to the to the leopard that it's capable of attacking something, of dragging it up a tree, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, where, where does that come into play in the process of being a Jew? Because in fact, the rabbis explain that what Yehuda ben Tema was saying is there are four core ingredients that are required from a person to be the best Jew that they can be. You need to have chutzpah, okay? You need to have uh, uh, strength or courage, the courage of the lion. You need to have the lightness of the eagle. We'll cover that in just a minute, what that means as well. And you need to be the swiftness, the, the speed of a deer. What are these four things? What do they represent? And how are they the four cornerstones of being a great Jew, uh, of being a person who's constantly growing and developing? So let's take them one at a time. Whenever there's a number of things, and we give you one, two, three, four. What do you know about number one? The first one in the Mishnah. What do you know about it, huh? It's the most important. Okay, what else could it be? It could be it's the most important. What else could it be? It's the first thing that needs to be tackled. Because oftentimes, the thing that you do first is not the most important, but you can't get to four unless you've done one. So stretching before exercising is very important. It's what comes first. It's not the important part. You're just stretching, so the point is the exercise. You're stretching in order to make sure that you don't get hurt by the exercise, okay? The first thing that a Jew needs to have is uh, a feeling, I just don't care. I don't give a darn. You could go and jump off a cliff for all I care. You need to have chutzpah. What is the chutzpah that is necessary to be a great person? If you ask, why is it that most people fail in life? The, the, the most common and the most important answer to that question is not that they did not have opportunity. Sorry? Low self-esteem, self good. Um, we'll see, I want to kind of parse that even more. It's not that they didn't have education. Lots of people who do, who've done, you know, succeeded wildly beyond that do not have the, a full education. Full education. Lots of people who succeeded tremendously don't have a lot of backing financially. You know, what is it that causes most people to fail? They don't have the chutzpah to succeed. So where does fear of failure come from? Where does a lack of self-confidence come from? You say to yourself, who am I to accomplish this thing? I, who am I? So many people are trying. Why would I be successful where so many others have failed? There's a chutzpah, an azut, in trying for greatness. Could you imagine a giant fat guy, you know, climbed down out of the stands at an Olympic stadium at, uh, you know, at a 400-yard dash. You have all these people standing there, and he comes down to this one empty slot, he gets down, you know, and he puts his hand down, he's gonna run. That takes a lot of chutzpah. It takes a lot of boldness, a lot of brazenness. 
A, and if we were to kind of categorize it even further, I think that one of the key char characteristics and components of azut is a willingness to fail. I don't mind failing. I don't mind falling. I'm not embarrassed. What is someone who have chutzpah? They're not embarrassed to fail. They're not embarrassed to have egg on their face. So they'll give it a try. More often than not, it's not about people's failed tries that keeps them from where they want to go. It's the thought of the failed try that stops them from even trying. So they, ha it, they haven't tried, but not because, they, not because they, they tried and failed so that doesn't count as a try, because that they weren't even willing to give it a go. Every nation on earth comes to Har Sinai and God says, I have a Torah, do you want it? And they all say no. Why they all say no? Because God told them about something in the Torah that was difficult for them. And specifically, God chooses a different mitzvah for each nation, the Midrash says. He comes to the B'nai Esav and he says, do you want my Torah? And the B'nai Esav says, what's in it? And God says, thou shalt not kill. And the children of Esav say, what are you talking about? That's our characteristic. That's our characteristic. You know, the bracha that we got from Isaac as the children of Esav is, Al Khar you should live by your sword. We, we are swordsmen. We are warriors. That's who we are. The Torah says you can't kill. I don't think we could do that. He goes to another nation that was famous for their um, thieving ways. And he tells them they can't steal. To another nation that were passionate, uh, you know, uh, about intimacy um, and, and, and that kind of train of, uh, of behaviors. And God says, tells them about the rules, about arayot, about thou shalt not commit adultery. So each nation was given the mitzvah that they would most, they would struggle with the most. But specifically, that they would struggle with the most because of their nature. Every one of them said no, because they thought to themselves, how could we ever do this? I could never do this. The first thing a Jew needs to have, and without this you cannot start the process, is a willingness to try things that they'll probably fail at. I don't want to start doing this, Rabbi, and then it's going to be too much. Give it a go. Maybe not... The, the largest form of itself, but give it a go. Just try. So many things, so many projects that I've started as a rabbi, people told me before I started them, why are you bothering? It will never work. It will never work. It will never work. It will never work. And then it works. And then I see them and they're like, you know what, rabbi? I didn't think it would work. Kol kavod. It worked. How did you think, they asked me in London, how did you think to go do this? I said, because I'm not from here and I don't know what's been tried. So I didn't know that you had to fail, so I gave it a go. And Baruch Hashem, with the right people, with the Siyat HaDashmai, with the help from God, you know, we, we got those things done. The first thing you have to have is Azut, Chutzpah. Chutzpah to do, to try. So I want, as we go through this Mishnah, I want you to think of some of the things that you wouldn't dare try. What would that be? Write it down if you've got a pen and paper. What would you not dare to try? To finish a sefer, to finish a book of, of learning? That's a big thing to take on. To try and do Shabbat properly with all of its laws? It's a big deal. You know? To try and decide to take on that there's going to be a time of day, an hour or two, whatever, that you don't speak a word of Lashon Hara. Taking it on for a week, for a month, for a year, for life. You know, I was just reading a story. It's a famous story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'm just going to tell you the beginning of the story. There was a man who didn't miss a minyan in 30 years. He gets to Israel late, 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 late one night, and he's missed his minyan for Arbit. Very famous story. I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. 
You know why? Because for me, it's not about that night. It's about the fact that he didn't miss a minyan for 30 years. Do you know how many minyans that is? Someone can, uh, can type it up. 365 times three at least, right? Times 30. That's wild. Got it, Leah? It's a very good story. It's a great story. But that story's been told so many times, I don't want to tell the story. 365 times 3 times 30. Nuts. 32,850 minyans in a row. You know, I'd love to be that guy's rabbi and just like rock up in like year 35 of not missing, you know, 40,000 minyans in a row and just walk up to him and been like, do you come here often? <laughs> Never seen you. <laughs> not seen you. Are you from around these parts? Are you from these parts, partner? Right? Yeah, you get me? Number one, to be bold in choosing something big, in dreaming about doing something big. That's how we start. Because this whole experiment, the experiment of the Jewish people giving a bunch of slaves a Torah and telling them to go live their lives like heavenly princes, like angels on high, that's like chutzpah. So I always thought there's something really interesting here. What is the boldness of the leopard? And how does it manifest? Think for a second about the way a leopard looks. What does a leopard have? Spots. spots. Right? Leopard has spots. What's the purpose of the leopard's spots? Camouflage. Camouflage. Excellent. Right? Sometimes a person who is nervous about chutzpah because they're scared to fail, the way you do that is by camouflaging. You take big things on and don't put yourself in a situation where you'll get embarrassed if you fail. Get it? So the way you have that chutzpah is by sometimes eliminating the possibility of the embarrassment of failure by creating camouflage. So as an example, if I do an hour a day of, uh, where no one's, where I'm not going to speak Lashon HaRa, but I don't tell anyone about it. So, you know, it's bold, it's a big dream, it's a chutzpah to think I could do that with the way I'm not Lashon HaRa I speak, let's say. But nobody knows. Nobody, know, nobody knows if I failed. So if I'm worried about being embarrassed, you don't have to tell anyone. Okay? So that's number one. The first character trait that is super important in terms of being a Jew is having chutzpah. The brazenness, the boldness to try and do something large, big, bigger than you. Okay? How many people are just in this life are just complacent? They just get used to a routine. And eventually, the routine's good enough. You know, their, uh, their life is good enough, job is good enough, their marriage is good enough, kids good enough. It's fine. Fine. Is that what you want from your life? Fine? Okay? I'm managing? But it, it takes a chutzpah to say, I'm, I'm better than this, and I deserve more than this. And therefore, I'm going to do something bold because of it. And until you sever those ties, until you cut ties with that old version of yourself, you'll just be sitting there always thinking about what would be. And it's scary to cut those ties. It's a very scary thing. But number one, bold. When God says to the Jewish people, time to leave Egypt, and they're like, okay, where are we going? Mexico? He goes, nope, the desert. They don't hesitate. That's chutzpah. That's bold. The second thing is kal kanesher. Ironically, I don't know if you guys were here, uh, not this past Shabbat, the Shabbat before, 
I spoke about this upstairs in the main minyan. Kal Kanesha is really weird. Light like an eagle. Eagles are not light. Sparrows are light. Hummingbirds are light. An eagle is like the heaviest bird. Right? Well, maybe not like an ostrich, but quite up there. Why, why is the Mishnah calling an eagle light? Sorry? What, is the word light or fast or high? So then don't use the word kal. And the, the commentators explain something really interesting. They say that the eagle is very heavy, but that God blessed the eagle with the strongest of wings. So it's capable with its muscular wing structure and, and, uh, and physiology of taking that weight and lifting it higher even than birds that weigh far less. So I think what we're learning here about the, the, the lightness of the eagle is something really impressive. Some people are light because they don't have weight. You know, if you're a good rabbi or a good wife or a good uh, lawyer and you've only done one case and won it, your record is perfect. You're batting a thousand. That doesn't mean that someone wants to hire you more than a guy that's taken on 50 cases and lost 30. But the reason why he lost 30 is because all 50 were impossible. And the 20 that he won, no one in the world could have won. Who are you hiring? The guy that took all the easy cases even if he took 50 of them and he won all 50 of them, what were they? Parking tickets. And the other guy, he's getting off murder trials and, you know, God knows what and 25, you know, you know truckloads of documents that they... It's just a different animal. The Mishnah is telling you, don't look to be light in, what, in the weight that you carry. Look to be light in how high you can lift what you're shouldering. A person who's light is a person who can put more and more and more on their back and, and still achieve liftoff. The Torah doesn't want sparrows and it doesn't need hummingbirds. They're insignificant because they're not, they're not raising anything. They're not lifting anything up. So the second thing is an ability to rise up even when there's something holding you down. Now sometimes there are things that are holding a person down that are, like we said, external. They could have someone in their life that's holding them down. They could have different difficult life circumstances that are holding them down. But a lot of times the thing that creates this weight or this baggage might actually not live outside of me. It might be some, you know, feelings of uh, inadequacy that makes me feel he heavy. It might be some form of fear that makes me, it's, this is really more about liftoff, about having the ability to pull yourself up. The boldness is in the willingness to attack and to dream. The kalkaneshim is in achieving liftoff. There's an amazing fact. If you've ever watched um, any of the space shuttles take off from Earth, you'll see there's this massive, you know, uh, 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 space shuttle. It's like, I don't know, 100 feet in the sky. And then it takes off and it's like, you know, and it goes and it gets all, you know, into the sky. And then what happens when it gets into the sky with this massive rocket? The, ra the rocket detaches. And how much of this giant rocket actually goes into space? That little small plane at the end of the rocket, right? I mean, it's not small, but it's small in comparison to the rest of the fuselage. Why? And this is fascinating. Based on the laws of physics, the vast majority of the fuel required in a space shuttle launch is to leave Earth's atmosphere. 
Once you've escaped the gravitational pull, the atmospheric pressures of Earth, and you're in space, you see that with the smallest, the, the thing moves. Why? Because again, lack of gravitational pull, lack of, of the same levels of friction in the atmosphere. So the vast, the overwhelming majority of fuel required for movement is to escape the Earth's atmosphere. The same thing is true about a person's growth. You're working hardest in that first 10% of movement. Once you're already in motion, you already left, you know, that the Earth, the pull of Earth, the pull of physicality, the simple desires, the peer pressure, etc. Then you're, you're flying with far, far less fuel. So says the Mishnah, the second thing is, Kal Kanesha, an ability to overcome things that are trying to hold you down. The largest effort is in the beginning. Kol Hatchalot, says the Gemara, all beginnings, Kashot, are hard. All beginnings are hard. So you brazenly thought of something, you've now shaken yourself as much as you can to try and get out there, to do something, to build something. Just know it's going to be really hard. But you have the wings to be able to pull yourself out. And I always thought it's so cool for an, an eagle to get into the air. What do they have to do? They unfold their wings and they're flapping really hard. You ever see an eagle in the sky? They don't even move their wings. They're just... Once a person's left the pull of earth, the gravity of friends pulling you down, your desires pulling you down, your lack of belief pulling you down. Once you're up there, there's already spirit, there's winds that take you places easily. The third thing in the Mishnah is Ratz Katzvi, an ability to act swiftly. You have some people who are paralyzed by indecision forever. They just don't make decisions. They don't like making decisions. They like to wait till the last possible minute to make decisions. Says the Mishnah, if you want to be able to accomplish anything, you need to be able to act quickly. You got excited about something, do it. Someone spoke about something, you like that in the class, do it. You wait until you got home, chalas, it's gone. Rabbi spoke about making up with someone, you had someone in your mind, walk out the shul, dial the number. I was just telling Jessica two seconds ago. I realized that whenever I get uh, wedding invitations, I look at the wedding invitation, oh, very nice, put it back in the thing, and then I forget to open it again. It, put it away somewhere. Right? It's not like you're looking at it every day. And then I forget to go to the wedding. So what do I do now? Ratz katsavi. As soon as I open the invitation, the very first thing I do is I take a picture of the invitation so that when I lose it, I can remember where to go. And number two, that the date is in my calendar immediately, even if I'm not going to go. That means that you don't miss weddings, you don't miss opportunities, because you're Ratz Katzvi. I always think this. If I'm sleeping in bed and the alarm rings and I really need to get out of bed, every time you hit the snooze button, the chance of you getting out of bed decreases. <laughs> you know this to be true. When you need to make a flight, what do you do? The second it rings, what do you, the second, before you even have a chance to turn it off, what do you do? Swing your legs off the bed, put them on the floor. Right? Ratz katsvi. You snoozed it, you probably lose it. Pardon me for the lack of grammatical acuity in that statement. I was just using poetic license. Yeah? Rats katsvi. <sighs> yes, rats katsvi. I, I, I want to add one more piece. How many things have you wanted to do that you have not yet done in your life are there? 
How many places have you wanted to visit? How many things have you wanted to do? Books you wanted to read? Whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Time you wanted to spend. Conversations you wanted to have. There's a reason why we put the word pro in procrastinate. Because everyone is so darn good at it. We are all experts at procrastination. Experts. But, but the delay of something is most often its death sentence. So to create a new form of reaction, which is Ratz Katzvi, I, um, I remember a while ago, I had the chance to go... Um, to go to South Africa on safari. We took a group there of many students, and one of the things that we did in South Africa was we went to the Kruger National Park. And over there they have lots and lots and lots of impala, which is a type of deer. I don't know if it's exactly the same biological genus as deer, so if I get a message from someone telling me, well, actually, <laughs> But you know what's really interesting about the way deer run? Like if you ever watched a cheetah run or a lion run, they run different. A deer jumps, right? It's not, right? There's, there's this, it covers space, it jumps, right? That's why we say uh, about the deer, it uses the lashon in the, in the uh, in the Pesukim of Mikapetz ala Givaot. He's jumping on the heights. The nature of a deer's jump is very simple. If you want to be swift and you want to act, a lot of times there's going to be something you need to jump. Very different than the way other animals run. The element which is unique about the swiftness of a deer is that it can jump. Because there's always a reason why you shouldn't do the thing that you want to do now. Always a reason. I can't, my kids, the kids are young, I just got married, I just got divorced, I'm gonna get married, my kids left the house, my kids came to the house. There's always a great reason not to do something today. But the nature of the tzvi is that it actually jumps as it runs. It can jump over the rocks or the things that would stop it. And that's crucial to be able to move forward in any project and anything that you want to do in your life. Okay? So the third thing is Ratz Katzvi. Now, there's one other piece which is famous specifically in the Torah about a tzvi. Anyone know? Eretz Israel is called Eretz Hatzvi, the land of the deer. Why is Israel called the land of the deer? You'd think it's because there's a lot of deers in it. No, the Gemara gives a different reason. The Gemara says it's called Eretz HaTzvi because if you ever skinned a deer and then tried to fit or to put the deer skin back on the deer, it no longer fits. The nature of the skin of a deer is that it stretches to accommodate that which is inside of it. So to Eretz Israel, which is such a tiny place, you keep thinking to yourself, how many Jews can we stick in this country? It just takes more and more and more and more. And it's like the land is magically, spiritually expanding, welcoming all of its children home. Eretz Hatzvi. If the Jews left, so to speak, you wouldn't be able to fit that many people in it. Why is that relevant? I think that there's a predominant, well, a important, let's say, aspect of being swift. And that is, most often, the challenge of moving fast is that people feel like, well, what about this? And well, what about that? And what's going to happen with this? We can't move today. We need to think this through. We need to have 57 meetings. You know, there used to be something called death by committee. 
You know, you'd have the committees discuss it. And then it needs to be passed from a committee to another committee. And then to another committee. And then, you know, Mrs. You know, Gertrude Brown doesn't like the project. Gertrude. Right? One of the elements of what allows a deer to move swiftly is the elastic nature of being able to take on board and to cover all the things that are within the project. So, if I'll need to deal with something, no problem. We'll figure out a way. The Kutzka Rebbe has one of the greatest lines I ever saw, and I, I, I love this line, and I try, if I can, to live my life by it, and it's not always so comfortable for people who are not on that program. The line is, Ask not if something is possible. Ask only if it is necessary. If something is necessary, you'll figure out how to make it possible. We don't have the money. Yes, you'll reroute other money there. You'll work harder. You'll take on an extra job. If it's not necessary, then it will die. But if it has to happen... There's going to be challenges, but we'll figure those out as they come along. Part of being swift has to be the fact that a person knows that he's got enough skin in the game to be able to encompass and take care of whatever comes up, whatever props up in this situation. So, as an example, a person says, Rabbi, it's too difficult for me to keep kosher. Why? My friends don't like going to non-kosher restaurants. The swiftness of the deer says... Is this the right thing to do? It is. If it is the right thing to do, then I have another question. The question is, how will I have or continue to have a social life if primarily what we do as a group is go out to eat? And now we can't go out to eat anymore together. Ask not if something is possible. Ask only if it is necessary. If you feel that this is necessary, you will figure out how to be able to solve the problems, how to be able to have space in yourself to incorporate and to include all the Jews that are trying to live in Eretz Israel. You'll make it work. But that has to first come uh, from this midah of being willing to actually act and not always coming up with the thousand and one expert reasons why you need to push something or you need to procrastinate. And finally, the last of the four is gibor ka'ari, to have the courage of a lion, to have the willingness and the strength to be able to do something. You know, it's one thing to have chutzpah. A lot of people say, yeah, I'm going to do it. Can't be done. I don't care. I'm going to do it. You know, and then they immediately launch into it. Kal, you know, ratz katzvi. And they have, you know, this problem and that problem, and they, they take the program up into the sky. But they actually, they don't have the stamina or the strength to run the darn thing. So it crashes. They don't have the endurance to be able to chase it down. They don't have the courage to be able to, you know, make a really tough decision. You have a lot of people that start companies. And it's a very scary thing to go out on your own as an entrepreneur. Do you know how many startups, I always read about these startups that do really well. Do you know how many startups fail? I think the odds are in startups in uh, like Silicon Valley, something like 10,000 to one. I don't mean, this is not in every startup. I'm talking about in tech startups. 10,000 to one. That means that there's 9,999 people who were, had the chutzpah to quit their job and start something new. They were able to, what's it called? To Kal Kanesher, get it off the ground and launch the app or the project or whatever. Kal Kanesher. They were able to ratz katzvi, run around, tell everyone, do, you know, not put it off, you know, launch the thing, etc., etc. Where did they fail? Where did they falter? They faulted in being able to have the staying power to sell their house. You know, Elon Musk is one of the richest guys in the world. He's also someone who went almost bankrupt twice. 
Betting on what? Betting on himself. Take all of his shares, take every dollar that he owns, while he's a CEO, throwing it all back into the thing that he believes in. That's Kibor Kari. You know, the willingness, the strength, the courage, the determination to not shy away once you've started on that path. You know when I see it? Someone started to do something a little bit more. Started to come to shul a little bit more, to go into classes. You know, they're asking kosher questions. They might be asking a complicated question on ma'aser and how to give tzedakah 10%. And then some one of their friends is sitting there listening and they're like, oh my gosh, you became so religious. 9,999 startups out of 10,000 say, I didn't know, no, I didn't become more religious. No, I'm not. I'm not like that. It's just that I they excuse their behavior. They excuse all the other midot. You should be proud of what you've done. You should be proud of that. Someone makes fun of you for it. Gibor Ka'ari. I never take my kippah off, ever. Then people will tell you it's dangerous. Okay, so I'll find another way. There's an element of gvura that's required, not for the initial, in the beginning, you have that chutzpah because you want to show. Oh yeah, I'm going to show you. Every teenager has the chutzpah to fight. I'm going to show you. I'm going to leave. I'm going to start by myself. I don't need your allowance. I'm going to make it on my own. They have the chutzpah in spades. They, they're willing to do all this. Where do they fail? The gibor ka'ari. They fail on the courage to be able to carry out their convictions. And ultimately, what is the king of beasts? The lion. So I started by asking you, why is it first? And you said, maybe it's the most important. In the world of the animals, what's the most important? The lion. Because all of those are necessary first steps. But if you can't push it across the finish line, I meet people all the time who have never finished anything in their life. They've finished a book, they've never finished a business, they've never finished a relationship. They're always cutting out before the end. What'd you, what'd you do in your life if you didn't finish anything? You didn't build anything, you didn't do anything. Gibor Ka'ari. To do Hashem's will in heaven. Now the Mishnah continues and says, it just wants to make sure that you understand. A person who's brazen goes to Gehinam. But we said before, you have to be brazen. A person who has bashfulness, who's embarrassed, he goes to Gan Eden. Oh yeah, well how come it's not in one of the four character traits then? It doesn't say you should be bashful. <laughs> what the Mishnah is teaching us is all those character traits, they need to be what they are in the service of La Sot Ritzon Avicha Sheba Shamayim. We all know people who argue just for the sake of arguing. You ever meet someone there in the middle of an argument, you're like, why you, you don't even care about this? I one time had an argument with a guy about how to understand the Pasuk, and the guy tells me he doesn't believe in Torah, he doesn't believe in God, and he's arguing with my interpretation on a Pasuk. I was like, why do you care? Like, literally, why do you care? The real answer is because he does believe in God and he does believe in the Torah, but it's very hard for him to agree to that because if he does agree to that, then everything that he's doing is wrong. And if he claimed, if, as he claims he doesn't believe in any of it, then everything that he's doing is right. Yeah? That's the real answer. But assuming that was not the case. There's no mitzvah to be brazen 
when it's not aimed at, focused on, something good. That can be very bad. A person who's kal kanesher, they're able to lift up every bird and just fly out of there. That could be an absentee dad. Right? Who's got the weight of the children and his marriage and everything. And you know what? He doesn't let those responsibilities hold him down. And he flies away. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. So what the Mishnah is clarifying here is, let me be clear. I don't want you to be brazen. I want you to be brazen for. In terms of what you are, I'd rather you were bashful. I'd rather you be someone who doesn't want to, you know, be contrarian, always fighting. Yeah? So the Mishnah is teaching us that we develop these traits, these natural traits, in terms of what they are, what, where they bring value. So a lion has one ton per square inch of pressure in its bite. A hyena, five tons, at least a brown hyena. Five tons of, squ- uh, five tons of pressure per square inch of its bite. That means that at the point where the teeth meet, it's coming down on that with five, like with the weight of dumping five tons, 10,000 pounds of weight. A brown hyena can bite right through your bones. Yeah? And yet, lions carry their babies in their teeth. You got to know when to hold them. Got to know when to fold them. Right? When are you showing your strength? When are you showing your brazenness? That's what the Mishnah is coming to communicate. That even within the nature of a, of a lion, because someone might think that if I develop the nature, I can't control when. When is a learned behavior? When is not a natural behavior? Lies. People are like, I can't control myself. That's just how I am. Lies. A lion is capable of snapping everything in its mouth. That doesn't mean that when, when it needs to, it can't lift the baby with his teeth. A cheetah is the fastest of all animals. They can run up to 70 miles an hour on land for a short amount of time. If a cheetah doesn't stop running at that speed when it's about to become exhausted, the cheetah can die from exhaustion. So even within nature, even when something is a natural quality, the nature of the being understands when it pushes that natural quality and when it uses something else. And I often think to myself, every leopard is also a lion. Every cheetah is also a lion. When the cheetah is running and hasn't eaten in two days, and it thinks it might just be able to catch this impala if it runs a little bit more at this speed. Do you know the strength, so to speak, of character that it needs to exert on itself to stop running? Yeah? There are times when the only thing you need to do is fight the urge to run. Just stay here. That's when the eagle needs to adopt the midah of a lion. You understand? So these four are anchors in the human experience. Something that pushes you to do things that you don't think you can. Something that allows you to rise above the things that are holding you back from doing them. Kal Kanesher. Something that allows you um, to move swiftly, to choose, to make these choices, and to act on, on uh, not let great opportunities 
pass you by. Life is full of people kvetching about the time, about the one that got away. The business deal, the relationship, if I was only, if I only, I could have fixed the relationship between my child. They came to me, I was angry, I didn't. Missed opportunities are all kind of connected to the Ratz Katzvi and the Gibor Ka'ari as well and the strength to be able to carry something through, to be able to eventually get to a place. Now, what's really interesting to me is also, when is the might of the lion displayed? Does anyone know? Yeah. No, you were just touching your head. Okay. What do you mean? You know who primarily protects the cubs? Yes. Not the lion. The lioness. When do you find the might of a lion? You'd think when it hunts, right? Incorrect. 90% of the hunting that's done for a pride is done by the females. When do you see the might of a lion? What? By whom? By another male lion. So it needs to fight to protect its pride. It, it doesn't let anyone come to get its, the lionesses. It won't let anyone on that territory. When it needs to defend itself, all the other fights, where's the might of the lion? Gone. What's the lion doing? Sleeping. So it seems a little bit funny that we're looking at this lion and calling it so mighty when the vast majority of the time it's sitting there sleeping. Except that even in this, our rabbis were teaching us a tremendous lesson. A truly mighty person is not always fighting. He's very selectively fighting. Very rarely fighting. If you find someone that's fighting all the time, what do you know about them? That they are truly weak. And it is their weakness which makes them fight all the time. People who are fighting with everybody have the lowest self-esteem, the largest inferiority complexes, to the point that every slight triggers them. A person who's very self-confident until something comes along, then they need to stand up, yeah? So we're learning as well from the lion, the concept of strength is not to use that strength all the time. Let other people do the jobs that they can do. Being a lion doesn't mean being strong, doesn't mean doing all the jobs. It doesn't mean micromanaging. Bosses feel like they need to boss people around. The lion's bossing around does not happen. He's asleep when they're hunting. He's trusting them to be able to do their job in the pride. And that is real strength. It's allowing other people to do their jobs without being overbearing and checking and asking for final approval on everything. You go to sleep. The phrase goes, I trust him or her with my eyes closed. That's the Ari. Finally, Yehuda ben Tema ends, He ends with a prayer, and it's really uncharacteristic of the Mishnayot and Avot to do so. And it almost seems that the prayer itself is an extension of his teaching. And I think that part of what the Mishnah is teaching us with this tefillah is that the system of achieving the four pillars of what makes a Jewish person a successful Jewish person, a successful person in this world, 
is such that a person who conquers that achieves a method, uh, excuse me, a modicum of perfection. Yehuda ben Tema says, I'm sharing with you the secret of how to perfect the world. As an example, if we had these four traits and we'd manage to teach them to humanity, the wars of the world would disappear. The fighting between people would disappear because the lion doesn't want to fight any more fights than it has to fight. That's the opposite of the proliferation of war. The challenge of people achieving or getting a parnasa, fighting over livelihood. The wonderful thing about being an eagle is the height at which it flies allows it to, see, to be able to see so far that you can have five eagles hunting in the same area and there's always enough for everybody. They don't fight and forage in the area that they're in. So two people fighting for business on the same street. That's what causes animosity between people. Two brothers or sisters fighting over the same territory, space. The nature of the kalut of the eagle allows it to be able to rise above these petty things and be able to, to create a space of hunting of Parnassah which is so wide that you don't have a problem with two eagles or three eagles or five eagles. Each one of these things achieves, is an antidote, if you will, to one of the challenges, one of the problems of the world. One of the big problems of our country today is the lack of a work ethic. People don't want to work. Much happier getting paid to stay home for unemployment. Yeah. Says the Mishnah, Ratz Katzvi. It should be in your nature that you don't just want to sit around, but that you want to run, that you want to jump. And it's so interesting that you find how these Kor Midot, they, in a certain way, they turn back all the difficult things, all the challenges with an imperfect world. Think about the idea that the fixation that we have with perfection in the eyes of others is because we don't have the chutzpah, the az kanemer, to just be ourselves. All of the world's problems disappear with these four pillars when they're solid, when they're supporting a healthy human being. Says Yehuda ben Tema, if we achieve these things, we will have done ours. May it be your will. Your, you should rebuild the Beit HaMikdash. We've done ours. You do yours. That's what he was trying to communicate. This is not a simple Mishnah. It's an undercurrent for a complete change of the way the world runs, the way people and the way people exist. So it's a very heavy Mishnah. It's a very heavy Mishnah. Okay, uh, that's enough for today. Um, we're looking forward to seeing everybody tonight at the engagement. Um.